Leon Caesar, thank you so much for joining me today. I have to say, uh, spending time with you during this conference here in Slovenia has been one of the great highlights. Your energy is amazing. Your expertise and know-how in the field is unparalleled. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. So uh, let's talk about your career. Let's talk about how you even got into this space to begin with. Uh, <clears throat> sorry about my voice, but I came into nuclear business, uh, let's say by chance. I was Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering uh, trying to do some uh, some finite element calculation in 86 actually um, <laughs> and the computer at the university was too busy or too small or something like that so i had a professor who took me to the nuclear research center because the computer there was a little bit larger and then i stayed it was the 86 the chernobyl year and um okay but when you got involved was this right before chernobyl i guess oh after oh after yes it didn't stop you no you were like big problem i'm a big solutions guy i'm gonna take uh, it on Actually, to, to make it very clear for me as a Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering, I didn't really expect that any technology will be there without failing. There were things yes. which failed, so it was just one of the oopsies to me at that time. Today, I see it a little bit more different, but still... More nuanced yeah. perception, but it, it still seems to me like the classic pragmatic engineer, like literally all my uh, mechanical engineering friends, the exact same approach to everything. Pragmatic, just okay. Yep, there is nothing is perfect. Everything not is trade-offs. People, not, not machines, nothing is perfect. So, <laughs> Okay, so you were sold on nuclear. What did you start studying then? Uh, so I stayed in solid mechanics, doing finite elements, uh, calculations. Uh, then I spent a lot of time with the old steam generators, with the damage uh, stress corrosion cracks in the steam generators. So that was my PhD, actually. So um, just to break down for the audience, uh, finite element is a way that you can uh, model the structures of materials, thermal, strength, and... Strength and, predict and cracks, predictive cracks will propagate or not. And uh, the steam generator in a nuclear power plant is this giant vessel that has a bunch of tubes inside where one liquid is on one side, one liquid is on the other side, and you're transferring heat between the two without those liquids touching each other. Is that right? Uh, that's right. But it's actually the, the tiniest boundary between the primary and secondary fluid in the uh, pressurized water reactor. So it's about, what, three quarters of an inch tube, yeah. like the pipe work in so the tight? house. Uh, the the uh, tube actually stops or, or obstructs the heat transfer. So the tiniest the tube, the better heat transfer. That's the trade-off you're talking about. I see, because you've the got... the thicker the tube, more solid it is. <laughs> right, so you've got the fluid on one side, which is very hot. Yes. And then you've got a wall, a solid wall. That's your tube. Solid wall. And uh, the heat has to actually push through that. Through, through that. conduction. Yes. And um, so the thinner it is, the more readily it goes through it, because you really want it to heat up the fluid on the other side. That's true. That's exactly the explanation. But because it's thin, it's subject to cracking. Of course. And that's what you were studying and trying to figure out how to deal with. That, that's true. And that, that was the, in, the, in the end of the century, a lot of steam generators and PWRs uh, were replaced because of the cracking. So we, uh, I was at that time able to support the utility to operate with cracked steam generator a little bit later. Not only me, but I was around with some calculations with the guys who did non-destructive inspections and licensing of uh, of the operation with the a little bit damaged steam generator tubes. And how do other industries deal with this? Other industries, I'm sure chemical, need to transfer heat between one fluid and another fluid. Do they have other types of uh, devices that do no, this? No, th these devices are similar. Um, it's just the perception of what, what happens, what if it fails. Mm. These perceptions are a little bit different. The nuclear perception that what I learned when I went to the job is that things must be very close to perfect and the failure is not really an option. Tell me about that. Tell me about um, that, that culture and when it begins and how as an early engineer you're brought into that theory, that mindset. I think young people simply follow that. Now, again, I was in the, in the research center, so the, the level of creativity in the research center um, is towards the know why, so we didn't, want, didn't have to have too much procedures and stuff like that. We could do whatever actually we wanted in a sense that you are creative because sometimes if there are too many rules, 
people are difficult. It's very difficult to be creative. You just said a word. You said no why. And I picked on that, uh, your presentation yesterday, best at the conference so far. <laughs> uh, and one of the topics that you focused on was know how versus know why. Can you explain that concept a little bit more? Uh, yes. You know, in very, in very simple terms, when we start to learn from our environment, when we are very small children, the first approach would be to copy what other people are doing. And with this, we get the recipes, the know-how, the understanding, abstraction of these things comes later, a few years later. And uh, then in the ad adult world, uh, world, if you want, then the, the know-how would be cooking by the recipes or operating a plant by the recipes or flying a plate by the pro plane by the procedures. And it's usually good 99.9% .9 of the time. It makes things perfectly safe. The problem becomes that you need to know, how, know why. You have to understand what's going on the minute you are out of the procedure. That recipe analogy is almost perfect because we've all had um, food from somebody yeah. who uh, doesn't know how to cook, but can, can read a recipe <laughs> and follow it perfectly. Yes. Literally, everything about it is perfect, but something might be a little bit off and we don't know why. But then, like my mom or, you know, your mom or who knows who really knows why things work and knows yeah. all the tricks with salt and this and that, uh, their food is much better. Yes, but experimenting, actually, because we're not perfect, yes. always brings a little bit of the risk. Ah, okay, so risk, experimenting. Um, academia. Academia is meant to allow for room for experimentation, to develop that know why, isn't it? Oh yes, we learn, uh, the issue here is that we learn the most from our mistakes. Yes. <laughs> so if we cannot make mistakes, and academia learns from mistakes. I mean, I think literally all engineering is done by you build something, it breaks, and yep. then you look at what broke, and then you add a little bit yep. more of this. Add, that's all engineering in the world. Yeah, but if you're lucky, it broke It, it broke uh, to your predecessor, not to you. So you can <laughs> learn from the mistakes of others too. <laughs> yes. Though sometimes you have to experience it yourself. Yes. <laughs> um, but the nuclear industry uh, doesn't really uh, encourage letting things break and letting things fail to see where it fails. No, in, in some communications, at some conferences, um, we had uh, discussions about nuclear oxymorons. There are something, there are very many nuclear oxymorons, which I like. <laughs> the one is like, we have this safety culture. Yeah. It's the culture to prevent people from making mistakes. That's the purpose, to prevent people to make mistakes. It's a very good purpose, by the way. Yeah, but, that's what you're saying. But if you put the statement, but unluckily we only learn from our own mistakes. It could also be seen as a culture which prevents people from learning, yes. which is not a good thing then. So it could be, you know, a little bit of a, we should probably find a new balance um, yes. in this. A little bit of experimenting is, is good. Of course, uh, not too much experimenting. So, um, <laughs> so your career, so you got involved in the research facility, but you've also developed a career as a professor as well. How, yeah. how have these two things uh, worked over the years? Well, I, I actually do more or less three things uh, because I'm coming from a rather small team. So my primary activity is to run the research department. The secondary activity, I'm also running the activities or coordinating the activities in our institute about the technical support to the national regulator. Mm. So I'm also involved in the, in the parts of the re regulatory processes uh, in direct contact with the plant and the regulators. And the third uh, topic is actually teaching. Yes. So I teach maybe one course of structural mechanics uh, for master students uh, in two years or something like that. But I do a lot of, uh, of supervising the PhD students. That's, uh, that's part of the research, more the research. Uh, uh, a great uh, channel for you to funnel uh, students into uh, research labs as yeah. well. <laughs> You're like a walking advertisement <laughs> to get people into the institute. <laughs> well, I don't have so many students, so I still have time to do a little bit more things like uh, chairing the European uh, Nuclear Education Network. Yes, what so is that? What is the European Nuclear Education Network? That's started as a club of about um, 60 European nuclear universities uh, immediately after 2000. Um, the issue at hand was the nuclear education at that time was really, really in bad shape. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, the first generation of professors uh, was to retire. Universities didn't see enough students coming in to these courses. So it was questionable whether there will be a new nuclear professor or not. Um, similar uh, situation was very similar in US at the same time. Yeah, and this is towards the end of the 70s, uh, sorry, at, 80s. Uh, end of 90s. Oh, yes, okay, yes. And then uh, in different countries, different actions were taken. So in US, the Department of Energy did manage to turn it. They pumped uh, money into other, it. They pumped they, a lot of money into schools. That's the solution. Yeah. Usually the mon money is the solution. <laughs> yes. Well, it's funny because I took on a couple of uh, nuclear interns uh, when we were building this you know, map of... Uh, map of the nuclear space. I had a bunch of nuclear interns, you know, looking at things. And I asked them, I was like, well, how did you choose nuclear engineering versus this versus that? And one of them was like, well, I was thinking about being a mechanical, but I got a full scholarship to nuclear. Yeah. And that does it. That does it. If you want, and, and once you're educated and once you're in it and you're in the field, you love the field. It's like all, all it really takes to get a bunch of new nuclear engineers in the mix is scholarships. Yes. <laughs> but, and but to support to professors with a little yes, bit of, of research course. money. And the other half, the other, the other half of education, yeah. yes. Uh, but so how, then how do you convince... Uh, the, so I see the apparatus in the U.S. that can convince the Department of Energy, which has a long nuclear history of all sorts, to convince them that education is important. How do you do that in Europe? Well, education goes down to national, uh, to the member states. Mm. That's a little bit, uh, little bit more complex uh, in Europe than in, in U.S., so <clears throat> Inan was a kind of a club supporting each other or sharing the experience how we can talk to our uh, politicians in different, uh, in different countries. Uh -huh, very good. And we were supported all the time by some projects and some project money um, from the European Commission. That's uh, what we are very thankful. Yeah. So we could do a little bit of work uh, together also, work more related to how to organize the education maybe some new courses, maybe some mobility money for students, that type of actions. Mobility money, that yeah. is so a student that gets their undergrad in one location can then go get a master's in another country, can then go get a PhD in another country, is that what mobility uh, is? Or even so, uh, only a few courses ah, okay. to move to another university for a semester or something, come back. Uh, there is uh, infrastructure for that in Europe, it's called European Credit Transfer System. Mm -hmm. So in principle, students can go to another university, bring the exams, and the home university will take them. Uh, uh, is there a lot of collaboration throughout Europe, just in the scientific community in general? Uh, Has this worked over the last five decades or so, getting Europe more interconnected yeah. through science? Let's say that the European Commission, at least in the nuclear fusion field, is pumping in about five to ten percent of the national sum of national research money. Ah. So there is some, let's say, seed money to work uh, together. It could be. Uh, a little bit more for fusion. They are in more in the billions. A lot more for range, fusion, probably. Yeah. Yeah. It's still it's still helpful. We we still know each other. We work together. A yeah, lot of projects. People learning similar start. physics, yeah. at least, yes, yeah. and and talking a similar language, thinking a similar way. So the upside is we can share the facilities. Ah. The downside is that by sharing facilities, there are less and less research facilities at the end of the day. Mm. Yes. Okay, that's the downside. So it's, it's the way, in military terms, one would say, okay, now we are stepping back a little bit. And, but if we don't start to push at some point, we will walk back until the end. So what's the specialty of the Jozef, is it Jozef? Jozef Stefan. Stefan. Yes. Jozef Stefan Institute. What is the specialty there? Uh, we are kind of <clears throat> national lab. Uh, we were uh, created as a nuclear uh, research uh, facility 70 years ago, but today we are a little bit off. The nuclear, uh, the nuclear research would be maybe 10% or less of the, of the activities. It's 1,000 people. Um, it's the main domains would be physics. Uh, so our people are working in, in, uh, in the accelerators in CERN, in Switzerland, in Bell, uh, in Japan. That's one side of the story. Another side of the story is biochemistry, so support to pharmaceutical industries. Also. Uh, we do a lot, at least in Slovenia, a lot of pharmaceutical business, I think, in Russia. Uh, the third, you can see a little bit of uh, nuclear heritage. There is materials people, but they are down to ceramics. So it's <laughs> <laughs> mostly to ceramics. And there is some um, artificial intelligence which stems from the controls of nuclear 
facility is historic. Everyone's excited about artificial <laughs> intelligence now. It's like so popular that people are like, oh, how can I apply it here? How can I apply it there? How can I apply it there? Yeah, in, in a way we are uh, quite uniquely positioned because we have everything of this in, in our house. Yes. Uh, what is only missing a little bit is the, um, so we can offer, but demand is a little bit low. Yes. In, and what do you want? So yes, you've got these incredible <laughs> facilities. Um, the world needs nuclear. Yeah. Uh, what areas, if you know, if you could just pick an area to focus on and say, "Hey, we're going to establish leadership in this line of thinking in the nuclear world," what would it be? Uh, sometimes I, f I think we are really, really uh, on the small end of the nuclear countries. So we are only two million people. Uh, so to develop a new reactor in-house or in in Slovenia would require probably much more uh, workforce than we can uh, put together in a reasonable time. So we are talking thousands or ten thousands of, uh, of person uh, years to do it. The way it's been done historically, but I don't like the way that it's been done historically. But still, one thousand person years is... Uh, yes. It's probably it's... a good order of magnitude. It's, it's huge for us, but participating, actively participating in some um, consortia of such uh, small or, or even big uh, large partners would be probably a good idea. And what about joint research or joint development? And what about something that's not uh, so complicated? Not a versatile, fast spectrum, this or that. What about just a simple uh, drop in the ground reactor? I think that, uh, you know, I, I'm just, you know, after being here for a week and meeting people here. I'm just such a fan and just see such opportunity for what Slovenia can do. And, and then I see uh, your institute and I see the nuclear expertise. And, uh, you know, it, to me, it, maybe I'm crazy because I'm not from the nuclear world. But uh, to build a building, you need a few civil engineers. So you don't yep. need a thousand civil engineers, you yep. need a few civil engineers. To weld some structures, you need a few welders. To design a reactor core that's just a, a smaller version of a light water reactor, yep. it seems to me that you've got everything that you guys need right here. Yes, but then on, on a, a little bit of funny side, you know, Slovenia geologically is pretty much karstic area. So <laughs> digging reactors in the, in the ground is not the best idea. <laughs> They can disappear. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is but, uh, essentially a, a, very good, a small yes. thing that just, you small, know, simple, beautiful. low risk, yeah. uh, low complexity. It seems yeah. like you guys could do this if, if you wanted to. Yep. We need shareholders to do that. Shareholders. Tell me about shareholders. Some money. Our research money at the moment is uh, pretty, pretty fixed, uh, focused on the support to the... Um, research to the operating nuclear power plant or close to the generation two or three. Yes. So that would be a jump. There's opportunity, there's, um, there's know-how. Uh, one other thing that you said in your speech uh, yesterday that really struck me, I even had to write it down, um, it was uh, rules versus common sense. That was another part of your presentation. Yep. Tell me about the rules versus common sense uh, ideology. Well, this is, this is um, another trade-off which is usually not seen very much. Uh, so if you would like to have things safe, the usual approach would be to the rules, to the recipes, to the, to the procedures. And with this, of course, you solve the majority of the, of the things which are known yes. when you write the, the rules. You didn't touch a thing about things which are unknown, and this will be left to the operators or the pilots when they struck them. Right. And it's at the point where the know why struck in the operation or creativity. And if, if somebody expects that, the, the, let's say, 99.99% .99 of the life will be by the procedure, then usually it's too expensive to educate that person beyond the procedures. So it's... It's a risk, you cannot do it perfectly. It's a risk, it's a justifiable risk. And that's for the operators, I would even say, or pilots, it makes probably sense to fix, uh, to fix it to that. But then you need another layer. So the third member of the crew in, in the airplane or uh, usually in, in the nuclear power plants, they have them, they call them shift advisors. Mm. The guys who should know a little bit more or about why and who could then advise what to do when they're out of the procedure. 
I see. That's very interesting. And the same. So it's a chef with a chef with some idea of how to cook, but the rest <laughs> they just the, cook by recipes. And the same could almost maybe be said in the design and regulatory process as well. There. <laughs> Sorry, I would expect even more creativity in design. Of course, you have to go. You have to go. Uh, at least at the beginning, uh, anywhere, and then you try to shape it down to the simplicity or uh, features you would like to have. Uh, but in the regulations, it's very easy to push things over the line, to make uh, requests, because it's not very easy to measure those risks and the, uh, or safety or how, whatever you would like to say. So sometimes things uh, appear to be intuitively safer if you put a, a, a rule, but then, of course, this rule requires uh, another actions which are not obvious, and these actions could destroy uh, the, the, the rule. I don't think I have a good example now. Well, I actually have one that maybe yeah. I can run by you, and you tell me if this works with your thesis. Um, if you only have the know-how, yeah. and the rules say um, every reactor must have uh, this amount of separation from people and this amount of cooling and this amount of that and that amount of that. Uh, and you must do these types of environmental permits. Okay, well, that's, that's the rules. But then um, if you know the why, maybe somebody could come to you and say, it's much smaller. It's not a gigawatt scale reactor. It's a micro reactor. It's 10 megawatts. Because of this, uh, it's, uh, we don't need um, we don't need 10 people operating it. We need a digital controller is fine because the consequence is much lower. And if the regulator uh, understands the know why, they really understand you know, the, the common sense, what's happening, they can say, well, of course, they made, they did, what we wanted was safety. They made it small, smaller is lower risk. They accomplished what we wanted. Know why? Okay, sign off. But if, uh, if they stick to the know how and it's rules, 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 uh, in order to follow those rules, in order to make the plants economical, you have to make them bigger, 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 yes. bigger, bigger, and then it's more risk. And so you didn't accomplish safety. Yep. Is that a good example? That's a good example in principle. Uh, why, what you are saying is adding more complexity to a complex uh, uh, system. Yes. Uh, has its own risks. Yes. So you may gain or not. That's, uh, and it's not very easy to show that. Right. So yes, as you get to these bigger systems, the 1600 megawatt systems, which I think is pretty crazy that they've decided to go that big. And mostly, I think it's crazy because of the civil infrastructure component to it. There, uh, you might be following all the rules, but you didn't realize when in order to build this thing, you need the largest crane in the world. The largest crane in the world didn't have this requirement. And all of a sudden, yep. something went wrong that you could have never imagined because they're now the largest facilities that have ever been created and you couldn't have possibly anticipated it. Yep. But you follow all the rules, so you did the know-how, but you didn't, you know, that's where it went. But you're out, in, in this way, you are out of the, of the, let's say, assumptions which were there yes. for the procedures. That's right. You went out of the assumptions because you went so big yep. in that and case, yes. With, without know why, the people might not notice that on the go. If with enough know why, they will notice they are probably out of the assumptions of the procedures. Right. Uh, sorry, now that you've got 100 coming to my mind, <laughs> another one is if these construction projects take so long, if it really takes 10 yep. years from start to finish, you might not even have the same people there. Nope. And so your rules might say, do this, 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 and this, but it, they never accounted for knowledge trade-off between people yep. as people retired, as people moved on, and that introduces a new risk as well. Or even cultural differences. So coming from another language, uh, yes. having it as a secondary language, something like that. I, I was talking to Finnish colleagues, the Olkiloto plant. I think they had one of the interesting pieces of information, information is they had about 60 languages on the site. 60 languages? 60 languages, languages on the In site. Finland? Yes. Ah, and that language is hard enough on its own. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> but there is 5,000 construction workers from everywhere. Yes. Yeah. And I think the non-conformance report could be done in eight languages. Oh my God. So kind of eight official languages on the... So imagine now the translation, the... the yeah, lock is the also added, added complexity, complexity to the system, which has its own risks. Yes. Okay, so what are, 
what do we do about that? So, you know, I thought you made a well, great... Keep it simple. Yeah, keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, but, okay, but then how do we affect that in reality? So I saw you made a, a, a great presentation yesterday. I was, you know, pushing for change uh, at this conference as well. How do we... Um, I'm flying home next week, but yeah. you're staying here. How do, you, how do you uh, take these lessons and make sure the next time that I fly back, something has changed by that point? Oh, changes in the system which is conservative and, and run by the, by the, by the uh, procedures is slow. Yeah. So one has to figure out how to change the procedure first and then the changes come. Uh, how do we do that? Phew, uh, <laughs> I think the easiest way is to start mixing the cultures. What actually happened um, based on, on these procedures is the different cultures are established within the nuclear profession. Yes. So it's the operators, it's the modification people, it's the regulators, to name a few. They eventually, in a few years, because of the rules and different views on the world, don't even talk the same language. Mm. It's a little bit now, uh, let's say, I'm trying to make a picture black and white to um, no, I understand, uh, yeah. just make it. So this and academic culture is completely different. Yeah. So I all the time feel these differences. We are not talking about the same things. We are talking about the same things, but the words could be a little bit different. The nuances, the subtleties, how we yes. express ourselves, what we start with, who we know, the side conversations. And the basic yes. assumptions. The basic assumptions. So for the operator, uh, let's make, again make a very, very um, um, black and white example. It's really to keep the machine operating and safe. Yes. For a professor, it's nothing to do with really, with really uh, keeping the machine safe. It's more, uh, if you would like, to find the ways to destroy the machine. Right, to understand its weaknesses so we, we can engineer solutions for them. Yes. yes, if you know how to do it, that's completely opposite way of thinking about the same thing than the operator. Yes. Like in football, you have attack players and you have defense players. Different game. Different game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They play on the same play, uh, play field, but... They... So do you act as a, a bridge across the community to help facilitate it, this communication between these subsets of cultures? Because you have your hand in academia, you have yeah. your hand in research, um, you get to advise the regulator. Uh, it seems to me like you are the perfect conduit to bridge all of these cultural differences even within the nuclear community. That's also that was also the intention of my presentation here to yes. to to try to make them also understand that we are in different we are doing the same from a little bit different positions. Yes. It's diversity. It's good actually for the business. It's good for evolution. You know, all diversity is is good, but. It's usually very difficult, especially from the business point, to embrace this yes. diversity. So, and probably this is the part of the of the let's say defeat of the nuclear energy in the in the Western world. Tell me I, more. Well, if you try to be defensive all the time, mm -hmm. uh, you can be very good. That's another way of looking uh, looking at it. So sometimes I say it like that: uh, nuclear power plants, the industry, they made a perfect case. They are closest to the perfect technology in the world. The safety record so is perfect. closest to the perfect. The only one problem, people cannot really believe that that's possible. Yes. So there are two ways to do it. Either you go back, you, you make it less perfect. Probably we don't want to do that. But then we would appear to people to be more human, so uh, more, more <laughs> acceptable. And the other way was proposed by uh, a nice guy, Hiro Saito. Uh, he went out of, of Japan after Fukushima and wrote a nice paper when he was in Singapore University that there was not enough nuclear engineers in Japan at that time. If you have, uh, let's just put it very simply, if you have enough uh, knowledgeable people in the society at large. So the people can re re rely to somebody from their uh, surrounding who knows about the technology and they trust the guy. Yes. They don't really have to have the knowledge what's yes. going on. They just need to trust that guy. That's how everyone, that's how everyone in society 
essentially makes their up their mind or opinion about everything. It's the person that I know in my family and my friends yeah. on the news that I feel comfortable listening to. If they said something and I feel like I know them, that kind of go with what they say. Yes, but that's also the reason why the nuclear uh, education should be there, and why the nuclear the, the nuclear engineers leaving the university should be many more than those working in the industry. But it's a victim of its own success in that case yes. because it takes such little stuff, I mean, just so little stuff to create so much power for the world that that means really there don't even have to be that many people involved in it. And the nuclear physics, the basic stuff, let's be honest, was done a long time ago. So we don't so, really need to be training, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on nuclear physics to run these plants. Not to Whereas run. A gas, gas or solar, when you've got a guy in your neighborhood who's installing solar panels because you need so many people just to get a little bit of electricity, uh, you feel like you know the industry better. And no, like uh, like in Slovenia, we have the old Austrian habit of fire brigades uh, in, in the villages, you know, so... Your heroes, uh, your societal heroes, those, your those fire, those fire brigades, yeah. they're pretty much aware you cannot switch off the, the uh, photovoltaic collectors. So you put them on your roof and fire comes. It's bye-bye. They will not... You, you cannot spray water on that. Oh, my God. So, you know, that's... Again, added ah, so complexity. You, yes. If uh, the electric battery in the Tesla car starts to to can't fire, water, you right? can't. You wait. It, oh my God. it burns until the end. There's no way to stop it. Ah, so the fire industry here actually. They know. They know. They know. We have a sticker for the house with the photovoltaic collectors, so they they, they don't have really to look at the roof. It's it's on the on the house. This house has photovoltaic collectors. I like this idea of um, the firemen almost being uh, community ambassadors for the energy sector and yep. for no knowledge transfer in a certain sense. They know the immediate risk, you know. Yes. <laughs> and a firefighter who is uh, trained to understand uh, how they would react to any sort of risk, whether yep. it be an apartment building fire or a, a nuclear accident or uh, a gas accident, or uh, they really can, because they've got to be prepared for everything, they can really uh, very pragmatically understand the spectrum of risk. It seems to me like firefighters could be our nuclear education tool. Or <clears throat> maybe maybe not directly, but we can also compare, uh, compare some. Uh, but it's a lonely profession, you know. Mm. So firefighter, when you need him, it's too late. Uh, when most of the life you don't need them. So why would somebody bother to pay for them yeah. if you don't need them? So it's a, it's a kind of the... Bit of a trade-off there. It's a trade-off, yes. Ah, even more of a reason maybe... It's also for nuclear engineers. Why would you educate them if you don't need them immediately? But that's... Ah, that is tricky. That's tricky. If you have a lot of them working in the, in the car or aviation industries because they're good engineers, they will find the job. Yes. They will still be the the uh, kind of ambassadors, understanding what's going on. Yes, though uh, I, I might say something a little controversial now, but I don't necessarily believe that uh, our nuclear engineers are necessarily the best ambassadors for our technology because of what we've done to the profession over the last 50, 60 years. We've made it so much about. Um, uh, getting to ever, ever smaller risks, saying the word safety a million times. If we have a bunch of nuclear engineers going around the world telling people how safe it is, they're not going to believe it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you shouldn't worry too much. Still, the academia produces people, in principle, with no why behind. Yes, yes. So yes, no yes. why people are, are very welcome. Yes. They get to know how stage later on in the industrial training. Right, I see. So if they come up through the academic sector, um, it, you're right. There isn't that same kind of. Uh, uh, they are not in defensive. Yes. Yeah, they're on defensive mode. It's yes, not yes. yet done to the end. It's still right. they just know the physics are the the main the main principles. That's a very good distinction. Yeah, that's the the main distinction between the know how and know why. Well, what we are trying to do in Slovenia, you know, we have a small research reactor Triga, which is still re reasonably easy accessible. So at the site of uh, our institute with reactor, we have exhibition about nuclear power mm. with a few experiments with basic radiation from the, from the air. Um, so we get school children there. Yes. 
And again, the size of the country helps. The, the one generation of school children is 25,000, so we can do half of them each year. Yes. And with this, we, we have half of them in the, in the, in the uh, exhibition, but maybe a quarter of them really standing on the top of the trigger reactor looking in the core. Yeah. So there is one to four probability that you find a, uh, a, child, in, a child in Slovenia with, uh, below 20, who already was on the top of a, re a reactor. And then they're not afraid of it no. because they stood right there. No. It's not, it's something knowable. It's not something unknown that yep. gives crazy fears. Brilliant. I, okay. And we take journalists there, you know, after yeah. Fukushima, I had, I had an interview with a journalist uh, on the top of the reactor. We were sitting there, like having feet in the water, not, not really, but chatting about with reactor core five meters away from us. Okay, now I'm going to go... Working on. one. Why doesn't, why doesn't the rest of the nuclear world follow that exact model? Everywhere that there's a nuclear facility, whether it's a trigger reactor, a uh, research reactor, or whether it's a power plant, how come they're not constantly inviting school children in, inviting journalists in, here, come look at the blue glow, uh, understand, look at these giant pipes, look at this motor that uh, for the reactor cooling pumps. The biggest <laughs> motors that, how cool is that? I mean, that'll get people excited about the technology. They should be, every facility that exists today should dedicate 5% of its budget towards educating people. Or being open, yes, to, to the visitor centers are around, depends on the... They've been shutting them down a yeah, lot. Well, that's the cost, you know, um, uh, the, and that's another part of the story, which I have sometimes uh, also commenting, and it goes about faster, cheaper and better. Mm. The pressure, I think, uh, in the industry is to go faster, cheaper and better. Mm. With safer, if you want, in nuclear industry. And uh, I think the last time when uh, somebody really tried to do that, was in the 80s with the American space program and result of faster, better, cheaper, faster, cheaper and better was Challenger in Colombia. Yeah. So it does not really work that way and uh, people you have to think should, long term. You have to think a little bit longer term, especially in nuclear. The machine will be there. A hundred years. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's like, a good thing too. I mean, right? It's like you, a stable part of our infrastructure that you know will be there providing for people, providing yeah. prosperity and energy. For yes, people. the machine. But yes. uh, capital of Slovenia, Ljubljana, yeah. in the hundred years bef between the First World War and hundred years later, the capital was in eight different countries. How many? Eight oh, different countries. God. So that's hundred years of human history. <laughs> right. And it's hard to know. The yet. change outside is huge. Oh. Can we think about reactors differently? Is there a model for reactors that don't last 100 years? These yes. small modular ones, perhaps, you know, uh, they last 20 years. You dig a hole, you put them in, uh, they power 20 years, you un undig the hole, you take them out, you move them somewhere. It's a 20 year thing, much more manageable, much more understandable. Is yeah, that but possible? It, it requires, of course, it requires that the, the whole cycle is, uh, is there. So we have some some waste management facilities where we can bring this, or we have reprocessing facilities where we can reuse part of the materials. But in theory, I mean, that's... Uh, that's I mean, done for both, 60 years. And you and I both know that um, the waste is not a big problem. The waste is not a poison that's going out there killing people. You know, it's just something nope. that needs to be moved from one location to another, a little bit of concrete, you're done, essentially. That's true, and but it's not done. It's not done. It's not done. The closest is Finland. Ah, right, right, right. I see what you're saying. In, terms in theory, of, uh, all these things are, are very clear. So we know how to reprocess the, uh, reprocess yeah. the fuel. We know how to burn the... You're saying uh, actually implemented in society. As yes, it's not yet. implemented. But we could... Uh, it, sometimes I think it's because we talk so much about things that they don't get done. If we just said, listen, the assumption is it's going to get done, let's start building up our nuclear industry. Eventually, it'll become a big industry, and there'll be a company that just handles it and sees the opportunity and it just gets done. I mean, we don't have to think so much about everything. We just say, let's build. That's our culture. We are a little bit <laughs> careful. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so tell, tell me more about your culture. What's it like here in Slovenia, day to day? And just give, 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 your last interview that I'm going to do here, I want to get a sense, I want to give the world a sense of what Slovenia is like. Oh. It's a very nice country. Uh, I like to describe it in the way uh, that my house is positioned about 20 or 15 minutes drive from my office. Yes. 
I'm in the village, at the end of the village, so the woods are behind me. I can go walk for three, four hours with the dog without really seeing any people. At the same time, I'm 20 minutes away from the airport <laughs> and 25 minutes away from the center of the capital city. Amazing. And That's, an hour away from the beautiful coast. Um, and this coast couldn't be more beautiful. Hour did away. you see the sunset last night? Yes, I did. Hour I, away I from the coast. I was almost brought to tears. It was so beautiful. Yep. The whole sky was orange and red. And the water, it, it reflected off the water. The water yep. looked like it was glowing purple. Yep. Beautiful. Beautiful. This is one of the most beautiful countries I've been to. And 20 minutes to the first ski ground. Yeah. With 2,000 meters uh, of, of altitude. <laughs> so, and let's say within driving distance to most of the of the European uh, ski grounds in, in, in the Alps. So, Perfectly positioned. Perfectly positioned, uh, already taking environmental leadership in a lot of ways, yep. could continue to take uh, environmental leadership. And what I'm pushing for, technical leadership. And uh, as we wrap up here, maybe just kind of leave us with your thoughts of why nuclear is important and where the world could be. Well, nuclear is important to me as, a, as a really the solution of our energy problems. The, the, uh, you mentioned energy density, that's the most important thing, it actually enables us to move a very little amounts of materials around. Like, uh, I like the comparison I also tell whenever it, we, we are uh, discussing the legacy of the, uh, of the high level waste. Well, yes, but for all the electricity, nuclear electricity I will take in my life in Slovenia, it is one deciliter of high level waste. Yeah. That's because I only get one third electricity uh, out of nuclear. <laughs> if it would be 100% electricity in my life, it would be a small Coke bottle yeah, yeah, of yeah. waste. That's it. Crazy. In my, in my life. Whole life worth of power. Life. Unbelievable. And I do, without really thinking about, maybe 100 of liters of general waste per week in my house. Nobody cares about They charge me. A few, a few euros or a few dollars to take it away. They throw it somewhere. I don't know where. <laughs> it's orders of magnitude out. Yeah. And it's still so difficult to convince people that that is the solution. But okay, let's try to do that and make it, uh, let's say, how they say it, uh, beautiful again. <laughs> Leon, thank you so much for everything that you've done for this community, for Slovenia and for the world. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Brett. Thank you very much for being with us awesome. and helping us a little bit. <laughs> <laughs>